Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar. I am Maloney Dhru, treasurer of DC chapter of ICAI. We are pleased to host this CPE webinar and bring to you one of the most relevant and highly anticipated topics in the field of audit, automation and use of artificial intelligence, machine learning in audit. And now with great pleasure, I introduce to you our guest speakers. We have with us Parikshit Acharya. He is a CA, CIA, and CISA with nearly 20 years of internal audit, finance, and risk consulting experience across large corporations and big four firms. He's currently the director uh, of internal audit at Hewlett Packard Enterprise, heading the data, and data analytics, operational, and operational tools, and fraud investigations team. He's based in Bangalore, India. We also have Thomas Spicia. He is a CIA and CISA with nearly 15 years of internal audit and risk consulting experience across large corporations and big four firms. He's currently the senior manager in HPE internal audit team, managing the data analytics practice. He's based in Wroclaw, Poland. Thank you so much guys for joining us today. Now, most of you may have heard about the iAudit software. It has been in the news for completing um, a three month audit in just like 30 seconds. Um, as our speakers, we have with us today, the founders of Infilitix Private Limited, the company that developed the iAudit software. We have CA Palak Vasa, the founder and CEO of Infilitix, an auditor with five years of experience with ITC Limited, he has audited numerous businesses from tobacco, uh, FMCG, hotels, paper, agri, and infotech. We have CA Mansi Jen, the co-founder and COO of Infilitix, an auditor with five years of experience with EY and Deloitte, and has audited some of the biggest brands in telecom sector. Uh, we also have Smith Parsanya. Uh, he is from IT Rurki, the co-founder and CTO of Infilitix. He was a senior software developer at Flipkart and was instrumental um, in implementing a new inventory system at Flipkart. Palak, Mansi, and Smith, thank you so much again for joining us today and taking time out to share your valuable insights with us. Um, and a quick reminder to all those who have joined us, please message your name and membership number directly to me in the chat box for CPE credits. And, you and if you have any questions, you can ask them in the Q&A chat box. We will try to get to them at the end of the presentation. Uh, we will also be uploading our session on YouTube. So for more information and details, please visit our website, www.icidc.org and check our YouTube page. You can find us as ICIDC. You can also follow us on our social media platforms, LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, again, as ICIDC. And now my colleague, CA Gokul, the chair of ICIDC chapter is going to say a few words. Over to you, Gokul. Uh, thanks, Miloni. And uh, thanks to all the speakers, uh, Parikshit, Thomas, uh, Smith, Palak, and uh, Mansi for joining us today and uh, all the attendees. Uh, I'll not take too much time because we'll give more time to the speakers today, but uh, uh, just to give a brief introduction at uh, Washington DC chapter, we try to, one of the uh, objectives, what we do is uh, knowledge sharing and try to bring in a lot of relevant topics of today and uh, create a platform for all the uh, experts and uh, interested parties in accounting, auditing, taxation to connect and uh, share knowledge and uh, bring together. So that is one of the objectives of our chapter. And today uh, we have a very uh, young group of speakers you can see, and uh, that is a uh, more relevant topic about audit because a uh, lot of has been spoken recently in the past about the future of audit profession. What does the future hold for the accounting professionals and a lot of automation uh, and uh, is going to remove a lot of manual interventions. Traditionally, we used to do audits, which was more or less a post-mortem exercise. And by the time auditors finish the exercise, uh, most of the audit findings would become irrelevant and uh, it was much uh, taking too much of time. And today, thanks to a lot of automation initiatives, uh, uh, we are saving a lot of time in audit and audit is no longer the post-mortem exercise, but rather the 
proactive thing where auditors use a lot of uh, analytics and uh, uh, other technologies to alert uh, the management as well as uh, uh, the other parties who are interested uh, to find. So today's session, we will learn a lot more about what is going on, what future holds and how uh, companies and uh, others are adopting to this technology and what uh, the future uh, holds for the manual uh, interventions in audit. Uh, so our speakers will uh, talk. And as we go about, if you have any questions, you can post them in the chat session uh, box here. Uh, just a quick disclaimer before we start, uh, this session is only for uh, knowledge and educational purpose. So ICAI Washington DC nor the ICAI uh, HQ uh, does not endorse any of the products or companies uh, which is discussed during this session, which is only for educational purpose, but uh, yeah, users can use their discretion and contact the speakers directly on any further information. With that, I'll hand over to uh, our senior uh, DC chapter member uh, Kalpesh Desaiji to just give a few words before we move on to the session. Thank you. Thank you, Gokul Das. Uh, of course, I mean, all what you have said really makes a lot of sense. And I think probably it's a great motivation that we are heading in a particular direction where probably it was being understood in late years that audit is dying out of the profession and it is not really effective tool anymore. Because as you rightly said, it was a postmortem, and therefore it was losing its value and importance having been uh, auditing because people will move forward. But today, with this particular innovation and these two important tools, AI and ML, coming to is, of course, artificial intelligence is artificial. And it is a research or it is a replica of the natural intelligence which God has created in our mind, in our brain. So we have like a big, large computer as a large brain and a small computer as a small brain. So our computers are far away, but we have really created this tool out of them to make it more easy for us to do and perform our professional uh, services, which probably is giving rise to another avenue in the uh, professional world and we apart from going into the traditional part of our auditing and everything we would probably love to be one of the specialists with the help of the experts they are going to really educate us and maybe we'll probably see a new horizon of auditing in different forms so with the, all these kind words i would really go back and request meloni to take over this particular session and thank you and welcome all of you it will be a great educative session for us and we will definitely look forward to gain our uh, knowledge and be more empowered. Thank you very much. Sorry, I was on mute. Thank you, Gokul, and thank you, Kalpesh ji. I believe now uh, CA Parikshit ji is going to uh, speak a few words. Yeah, uh, well, first and foremost, thank you for inviting us over. A big thanks to the ICI Washington chapter, particularly uh, Gokul Das and team for having provided us this opportunity. So um, nothing much to say. I think Gokul Das and uh, Kalpesh sir have really uh, laid the foundation for what we aim to do today. So if you're okay, I can go ahead and start sharing my screen and we can dive into the session. Is, is that okay? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Okay, sure. I'm just going to switch off my video so that the bandwidth doesn't create issues. Okay, if someone can just confirm if you're able to see my screen. Uh, yes, yes, we can. Okay, all right, great. Let me put this on. All right, so hello, everyone. Um, a very good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, as the case may be, uh, depending on where you are. Um, I hope all of you are safe and healthy. Um, in today's world, I think healthy is even more important than anything else. So once again, thanks for inviting us over. Myself, uh, Parikshit, and my colleague, Tomash, both from Hewlett Packard Enterprise, uh, we are honored to be uh, speaking to you all today and sharing our thoughts. And I'll not go through this. I think Melanie already introduced us. I think the more important question is, why are we here today? So what we have on the agenda for you is to speak a little bit about our mission and focus areas when it comes to automation and analytics and internal auditing. 
Then we'll also just talk through, give you a glimpse of some sample projects that we have worked on. We'll describe what we did there so that it can also serve as some food for thought for your own initiatives. And then we'll do a double click into a couple of those automation projects, particularly our SOX testing automation, as well as our internal metrics reporting automation that we successfully accomplished within the HPE internal audit team. And uh, then we'll round up with some key learnings. So the objective really of the session is um, not necessarily to, um, from our side, not to demo any particular tool or project, but to share our experience and journey, because we are on a journey as everyone else is on a transformation from a traditional auditing mindset, a traditional approach to becoming a best in class uh, data driven audit team. And we hope that some of our learnings will also help you on your initiatives. So without much ado, jumping into the topic, our mission and focus areas. It's important to understand the mission of why we have embarked on analytics and automation. So our team's mission is to apply innovation and internal auditing. Now, how do we do this? By bringing in analytics and automation solutions. And why do we do this? We do this to help drive effective risk monitoring. Now, this is very important to understand because as, as most of you would know, internal auditing is all about assessing the risks to the organization and how well the organization is able to cope with these risks, what kind of strategies it has in place. That's why our analytics and automation is also driven towards enabling this risk monitoring. The second piece is improve efficiencies. With analytics and automation, we also want to weed out some of the manual tedious activities that our auditors have to perform so that we can reduce the load on them and they can end up focusing on um, on value add activities where they can focus on areas that require them to apply their professional judgment vis-a-vis -vis spending a lot of time on you know data extraction collation and that sort of activity and the third most important thing in our mission is to provide relevant business intelligence to our internal audit and enterprise risk management teams now with huge corporations as you would know there seems to be an information overload in today's world so how do you make sense of all that information i mean information is useless unless you can get insights out of it, right? So that is the third piece of our mission. And just a little more context here on where we are coming from, who we are. Um, both Tomash and myself are part of the corporate internal audit team of Hewlett Packard Enterprise, which most of you, I assume, do know that it's a global company. It's one of the leaders in the IT industry. Um, we are major players in the hybrid cloud space, as well as sellers of um, servers, storage, networking solutions and products. And we are spread across multiple countries, almost 100 with 60,000 plus uh, employees and thousands, I mean, 30,000 plus channel partners across the globe. So since it is a US based company, a US listed company, we're also listed on the NYSC. So we do have our own in-house internal audit team, which is about 120 plus strength. And out of these, we have a dedicated 14 member team focusing on analytics and automation solutions for our internal auditors. We are spread across uh, India, Mexico, and Poland. And we have folks in our team who have a mix of technical background as well as audit or finance background. Now, this is important because we have a good mix of chartered accountants, CPA, CIAs, and so, but, but we also have data scientists, uh, software engineers, and programmers, because you do need both technical and functional skills to have an effective analytics program in place. Some of the tools we use internally are, uh, we do a lot of our programming uh, coding using Python programming language and um, Visual Studio. We also do our data visualization through Power BI. And uh, let's not forget good old Excel. We still do use a lot of that as well. Now, on the right side, you see this nice triangle here, which really encapsulates our objectives, our focus areas for internal audit analytics, as well as the benefits we are deriving out of it. On the topmost, you'll see enable impactful audits. So that is the core of why we have adopted an analytics and automation approach. So if you think of our company, for example, it's a global company, um, very complex systems, processes, and multiple touch points thousands or even uh, thousands of customers, thousands of vendors, thousands of channel partners, thousands of employees. So how do you make sure that the internal audit team can sift through all this, all these multiple data points, all the big data and 
assess and understand which are the key risks that they need to audit and provide assurance to the board of directors. How do you do that? And that is where traditional audit methodology and risk assessment methodology might not hold us good. That's why we need to have an analytics solution in place, which is what we drive with our analytics program. The second piece here is ongoing risk monitoring. Now, as all of you would be aware, risks are not static. The risk environment is ever evolving, right? I mean, this, the simplest example is this whole pandemic we are all living through. Who would have thought a couple of years ago, even as far as late 2019 or even early 2020, who would have thought the world would change in this manner? Who would have thought that a virus would bring all businesses to a standstill, all supply chains to a standstill? So that just reemphasizes the point that you cannot have enough of risk assessment and risk monitoring. And again, can we really keep pace with the risk environment unless we have analytic solutions in place? No, which is why we have a lot of analytics based approaches, even in our teams and ongoing risk monitoring is another key focus area for us. We develop tools to help our auditors keep pace with the changing risk environment. And we also partner for this with non-internal audit organizations such as legal ethics and compliance office, the enterprise financial reporting and so on, because we need to have an integrated approach to managing the risks in any company. The third piece here is increased efficiency. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we are always on the lookout for opportunities to reduce some of the load of our auditors so that they can spend more of their time on adding value to the business by performing more thorough root cause analysis, exercising their professional judgment and providing recommendation remediations to the business rather than spend a lot of time on things that can be easily automated. So now Here's a glimpse of some sample projects that we have worked on. Again, there are multiple, many of them, and uh, we just picked out a few which we thought will be of interest to share with this group, just to give you a, um, give you a glimpse of, of the art of the possible. So the first two here are automation initiatives that we ran for our uh, Sarbanes-Oxley testing, SOX IT general control space, as well as for automating our uh, internal metrics reporting. And I'll not spend too much time on these because this is what Tamash will dive into in the next couple of slides. But, but again, suffice to say, the objective for both of these initiatives was to identify those activities that are not really adding much value, but are taking a lot of time of our auditors. And once we had identified that, we went in, did some basic automation, which really helped our teams complete that particular activity much faster. Obviously, there was a savings in... Uh, hours that we saved by doing that. And what it freed up the auditors to do was really spend more time on doing much more deep dive root cause analysis for variances and uh, discussing with these with the business and finding a remediation solution for those. Now, the third one here is the channel monitoring analytics program. This is something I would like to describe a little more um, to give a business context here. When I say channel here, what, I, uh, what I'm referring to is the distributors and resellers that we sell through. So HP being a global organization, uh, we do sell, in fact, the bulk of our business, 70% of our business, our sales, is affected through the indirect route, through selling through our distributors and resellers channel. Only 30% of our business is where we directly sell to the end customer. And the reason for this is to have a wider reach and quicker reach to the end customer. Now, what this means is that we have to deal with upwards of 30,000 channel partners, different kinds of channel partners, you know, almost really large corporations, some small, some medium sized and so on. And in differing geographies under different regulations and laws and so on. And also for these partners, we run a lot of uh, special incentives and we also give them a lot of um, financial incentives and steep discounts so that they're able to position our product well in the market and sell to the end customer. So considering this is so critical for us, obviously there's also high risks here because you're dependent on a third party. So how do you monitor this space? We obviously need to have auditing in this space, but can you really audit 30,000 channel partners at a go? No, not with a traditional approach, which is why to help our audit teams, we have developed multiple tools under this program, which help our internal audit team understand the risk landscape of the channel partners across the globe and using those tools, they can identify and select the channel partners that we should be going in and auditing for compliance with our terms and conditions. A couple of examples there, we have a tool called uh, the Partner Risk Scorecard, which assigns a risk ranking 
to all of our channel partners based on certain predefined parameters. And based on this risk ranking, our channel partner team then decides which are the partners that we need to do a deep dive audit into, which are the partners where maybe they can use our analytical dashboards and do quick turnaround inquiry audits so that we have frequent touch points. We have some sort of a continuous monitoring over the partner's activities. Another example of the channel monitoring tool that we have developed and deployed is a pricing and discounts dashboard, which we've created in Power BI. Now, what this dashboard does is it gives various slices and dices uh, and views of our deal data, of our deal pricing data. So we enter into thousands or even millions of deals in a year. And what this tool does is slices and dices and throws out outliers that could be of interest from a risk perspective. You know, the deals which are bucking the trend, maybe it could be deals where we are giving really much more steep discounts than the average discounts that we give out to other partners in the country. Or it could be deals where we are ultimately running into a negative margins. You know, we are actually bleeding on those deals. So it throws out those outliers, which our audit teams then pick up from this tool and go in and do a quick turnaround audit. Speak to the business, understand the reasons, understand the rationale, find out why we have done what we have done. Does it make sense? Does it really give us ROI? And so on and so forth. Versus what we would have done earlier, where we would have waited for a year or two. And maybe if that particular country was going to be audited, then we would have done a post-mortem review of what happened a year ago, right? So this is a program that's really enabling us to be laser focused for an area of business which really matters to us. And again, thanks to advanced analytics. The last tool here I've listed is a country risk ranking dashboard. And as the name suggests, this is a tool we have created which assigns a risk rank to the countries that our company operates in. Right. And again, this is based on multiple weighted factors. For example, it takes into consideration the net revenues we are generating in a country, the margins we are making in a jurisdiction, the volatility of margins in that particular country. We also take into consideration external factors such as the Corruption Perception Index published by Transparency International, uh, which highlights the corruption risk, level of corruption risk in, a, in an environment. Also our own past audit history and investigations history and so on. So all of these come together in this tool and there's an algorithm which throws out a risk score for the country and a risk rank. This again helps our audit teams identify the countries that we need to go in and audit in a particular quarter or in a particular year. Because re remember, resources are limited, right? If you look, look at the size of the company, we have a, even though we have a hundred member audit team, but everybody has a different focus areas. There's multiple lines of business, multiple corporate functions, SOX initiatives, and so on. So how do you ensure that your auditors are really focusing on the areas which will give bang for the buck? That is enabled through these multiple automation and analytics initiatives. So with that, I will hand over to Tomas now to talk through a couple of those sample projects, particularly on the automation side. Tomas, over to you. Thank you, Parikshit. Um, hey, everyone. So I will spend the next several minutes to discuss in more detail some of the automation initiatives that Parikshit has, has just mentioned. And I will also wrap up our session with uh, discussing some of the key learnings coming, uh, coming from the automation exercise that we embarked on uh, in HP Internal Audit. So as Pari mentioned, uh, one of the key projects that we started actually in FY20 was around streamlining and automating testing of uh, SOX controls. So we started actually with SOX IT general controls and SOX SAP automated controls. As uh, these were some of the so-called low hanging fruits that we actually knew there were a lot of uh, potential savings in these areas. And with successful execu execution around this, we actually expanded the, the automation initiatives across other SOX processes. But let's stick to SOX ITGC and SOX uh, SAP automated controls. So uh, for the automation initiatives uh, here, we mainly use Python as we developed code to automate ac manual activities, tedious work that was related to obtaining data from multiple SAP systems that were in SOX scope. Uh, we also developed a code to transform and analyze the data that was gathered, then to identify population to be tested, uh, help our colleagues from uh, SOX team to select uh, uh, targeted samples, rather like uh, some random samples to be tested. 
And also we identified uh, automatically some of the outliers where our colleagues from, from uh, SOX team could actually go, go back to the business or to the HBIT and question these. And on top of all these uh, activities, we actually also streamlined and automated the process of uh, creating work papers. So pretty much uh, the auditors do not need to like fill in the work paper uh, at all. They have everything ready uh, with the script that are uh, scheduled to run. So when, it, when, you, when you think about the benefits coming out of that, uh, as you can see on the slide, uh, these actions uh, already resulted in close to 700 of hours saved on an annual basis. And we also estimate that we will uh, save further 350 by the end of this year when we finalize on the open projects that we have. Uh, however, uh, time savings are actually not the only benefits coming out of uh, these automation initiatives that, that we started because we also managed to eliminate reliance on uh, control owners or uh, subject matter experts to provide us uh, with initial data. We eliminated potential human errors that can always uh, happen. And uh, we also eliminated this tedious work that our colleagues from SOX team had to do to gather the data, to analyze the data, to make all the, the data gathering and transformations. And with that, we actually allowed our uh, SOX team to execute the testing anytime they need, not, uh, and they don't need to wait for like the control owner to find like a uh, time for them. And this all leads to quicker completion of the testing. Uh, so when you think about the automation and, and benefits coming out of the automation, Definitely time savings is like uh, a big deal, but there are like, uh, there is a lot more uh, than time savings coming with that. Uh, Parikshit, if you could uh, please advance the presentation to the next slide. Um, hello, Parikshit. Seems like we lost Parikshit. Yes, uh, he did mention there were some connectivity issues there. Okay, seems like the presentation is uh, refreshing. Uh, Tomas, can you hear me? I think I... Yes, I can. Yeah, I've just moved the slide. Sorry, I think my connection just went a little unstable. Can you see the next slide? Did you want me to... Yes, I can. Thanks, Barry. And no problem at all. Okay, sorry about that. Uh, no worries. Okay, so uh, the other project that uh, Parikshit has mentioned that I would like to talk in more details uh, was to actually automate the process of uh, tracking and calculating uh, weekly and monthly metrics related to audit delivery. Uh, so for that, we actually developed uh, Python codes to retrieve data from audit board, which is our system of record when it comes to audits. And based on that data, we designed and developed a Power BI dashboard that uh, allows uh, our internal audit leadership team to review metrics and perform a deep dive whenever needed. So by applying automation and uh, visualization tools, uh, we managed to have the metrics ready by pretty much the first or second day of, the, of every month. Uh, and prior to automation, uh, we had that metrics uh, finalized around like 10th of every month. And there there have been like some delays and there have been like a lot of uh, reliance on the manual efforts that uh, our colleagues did. So uh, with that, we were able like to provide more accurate, uh, more timely reports to our leadership team. And they have the ability to actually drill down to the very granular data uh, when they review how their teams uh, perform the audits, how efficiently and how effectively uh, they run the audits. Okay, Pari, if you could just uh, move to the next slide, please. Okay, and as I mentioned at the beginning, we also want to like share with you some of the key learnings uh, coming from this uh, automation exer 
exercise that uh, we started. Uh, so uh, with automation initiatives, we actually also uh, realize that we are uh, fostering this analytical mindset across uh, the IA organization, because whenever you start with the automation, you need to have like kind of clear uh, guidelines, what are the respective steps that you want to automate, and it also helps uh, to educate our colleagues from from other teams uh, how to more how to more efficiently and more effectively uh, perform the audits. What we realized uh, during this process is that uh, having the internal audit directors and chief audit executives sponsorship and and support. Uh, it helps a lot in driving these initiatives. So, uh, tone on of the top, uh, having like this this support from uh, the leadership team helped us to more effectively uh, continue with these uh, automation initiatives. And also, what we realized during this process is uh, starting small with with uh, the aim at so called low hanging fruits allows to actually showcase uh, our team skills, our team member skills, and automation benefits to a wider or internal audit organization. And that helped a lot in uh, driving our automation initiatives. Uh, one key point that I would also like to stress uh, out is uh, it does not make sense to automate processes or activities that are messy or that are unstructured. It's uh, better to first uh, redesign the process if it is a feasible option and only then continue with automation initi initiatives. And uh, one final point that I would like to uh, bring to your attention, uh, fail fast, learn and improve. Uh, there will definitely be failures when you embark on this journey, but you need to recognize them quickly. You need to learn from mistakes and you need to move on with uh, this additional experience and knowledge that uh, you get uh, out of these failures. Okay, Pari, next slide, please. Okay, so pretty much that's all we had for, for today's session. So I would like to, I believe we shall have some time for Q&A at the end of uh, webinar. So with that, I would like to thank the organizers for giving us the opportunity to present uh, our pleasure. And with that, I believe I will hand it over to our colleagues from Infilitics to present on AI ML in audits. Thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you, Parikshit and Thomas, for sharing your journey and experiences with us. It was really interesting to see the audit initiatives of HP and how the internal audit team functions and performs. Um, understanding, you know, the channel monitoring analytics program of HP was really actually helpful to me and the benefits of streamlining controls by testing, um, uh, by using tech to automate uh, repetitive audit in, uh, activities across SOX, ITGC, etc. was also really illuminating. Um, and also I really resonate with the key learning that is um, fail fast, learn and improve. So thank you guys. And um, Smith, um, uh, Smith, Palak, and Mansi, I believe I'm going to hand it over to you guys now. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Let me just uh, present my screen. Yeah, uh, is the screen visible? Yeah, it's perfect. Thank you. Yeah. So, um, uh, hello everyone. Uh, and uh, again, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending upon the time zones. Uh, hope you are keeping well during these uh, trying times. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you, Mr. Gokul Daspai, uh, Mr. Kalpesh Desai, Mr. Praveen Jain, and the entire team of uh, ICI Washington DC chapter for inviting us. And uh, thank you, Ms. Maloney, for the introduction. Uh, we completely resonate uh, with Mr. Parikshit's uh, point that, you know, automating auditing is a journey. Uh, and we are fortunate, you know, that uh, our colleagues have resonated with our idea of uh, three months audit in 30 seconds. 
Now it has helped to probably ignite or reignite uh, the the topic of you know evolving and changing the auditing methods. So jumping on to today's session, uh, there are two parts to this this uh, session: uh, automation and use of AI and ML. So I'll cover the automation part of it, and uh, my colleague Smith will cover the AI and ML part, and Mansi will give a quick uh, demo of the AI audit tool. So I'll just jump on to the session now. Uh, let me briefly introduce ourselves. Uh, uh, Meloni has already given a brief introduction, but uh, just to spend a bit more time, uh, I'm Palakwasa, a chartered accountant and a post clearing CA, worked with ITC uh, for five years. For the, for the first three and a half years, I was part of their corporate audit department and happened to audit numerous businesses of ITC, right from tobacco, FMCG, hotels, uh, paper, agri, and infotech. Uh, and during the stint, you know, I realized uh, that in spite of ITC being a huge conglomerate, uh, relies heavily on uh, on audit, you know, which is conducted manually. So uh, this is where, you know, basically the idea generation happened. That this is a space uh, where automation is required. And then I discussed this with my peers working in multinational companies or uh, multinational companies operating based out of India, uh, including the likes of Amazon, Flipkart, Asian Pants, and I understood that you know how audit is being carried out across the board. Uh, and that's where I realized you know, that audit is actually carried out manually. Uh, across all these uh, all these companies, uh, with me then is Mansi. Uh, Mansi is co-founder and CEO. She's a chartered accountant and she's master of data analytics. Uh, she was she led internal audit teams at EY and Deloitte for five years for a few of India's biggest brands, you know, including the likes of Vodafone, Idea, and Tata Telecom. Uh, while discussing uh, this with Mansi, I understood that auditing processes and bitfors also are you know, pretty much uh, done. Uh, but definitely, there's there's involvement of automation, but there are chance there are times you know where it is done manually. Uh, and to power the tech function, we have Smith. Uh, Smith is a co-founder and CTO. He's a computer science graduate from IIT Roorkee and worked as a senior software developer with Flipkart for four years. Uh, although Smith is not an auditor himself, uh, but he has been on the other side of the table, you know, uh, where he has explained a lot of business processes to the team of audit team of uh, Flipkart. And during last year, we all three got together and developed a tool named iAudit which automates various auditing processes, you know, right at a, at a click of a button, uh, right from data extraction from ERP systems to data processing and finally issue tracking and reporting. So now let's understand, you know, why automation and use of AI ML in audit is necessary, especially in the current context. The three important things have happened in the last decade, you know, which has necess necessitated the requirement. Uh, first, information explosion. You know, the quantum of auditable information is increasing rapidly and it's extremely difficult for auditors to be abreast of so many technological changes, uh, technological and regulatory, I would say, changes. Uh, second is financial frauds. You know, with increase in information, the global financial loss due to uh, fraud has increased to an all-time high of $5.1 trillion. And uh, third, because of the first two changes, the auditor's role has become increasingly onerous. Anything that goes wrong in the organization and auditors are questioned. So what are the challenges, you know, for auditors to cope up with the change in the last decade? Uh, first has been definitely audit is conducted on sample basis and hence high chances of uh, messing out on control gaps. Uh, second, lack of knowledge. Uh, typically audit is being performed by finance graduates who lack key skills of advanced data analytics uh, uh, and understanding a lot of complex ERP systems presently available in the market. Uh, third is definitely budget and time constraints. Auditors are always short on time. Uh, and, and resources, you know, so hence the areas picked up first are analyzed thoroughly while probably rushing through the rest of the areas. And uh, fourth is minimal technological penetration, you know, since ages. Uh, therefore, these challenges actually, you know, impact the audit quality that probably we have all seen somewhere in our personal experiences. Now, uh, let me just touch upon, you know, a, a life of an auditor or where the auditor spends the majority of the time, you know. So if I just break it up out into three broad groups, so the first auditor spends roughly 20% of the time in conducting risk assessment and planning by analyzing financial statements. Over here, auditor computes uh, various business ratios and carries out trend analysis you know, to identify odd patterns and outliers in the financial statements. At this stage, the auditor actually picks up areas, which is in his opinion are high risk items, uh, and designs audit programs, you know, that is less done audit checks to be performed in these areas. Uh, second, and the majority of the time consumption happens in the field work, you know, where the auditor will collect data, uh, structured data from ERP systems like SAP, Tally, Zoho books, uh, et cetera, and it will collect unstructured data sets, you know, like bank statements, tax returns, and physical invoices uh, from the client. 
uh, post collecting the data points, the auditor will perform analytics uh, and identify audit issues. And then these issues are then discussed with the clients. And lastly, business multiple rounds of discussion with the client auditor will prepare and present final audit report and document the working papers. Now, uh, we have been all through this particular journey just to you know, dwell, uh, 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 just to briefly highlight over that. So if you analyze the time spent by an auditor during audits, uh, then we can see that there are plenty of areas which can be automated, you know, and which are actually routine in nature. So uh, there are plenty of standalone tools already available in the market, you know, which addresses the challenges in each of these areas. So let's have a look at these uh, tools which is already available in the market. So uh, if, if you just see the risk assessment uh, and the planning, uh, 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 yeah. So if you just look at the first part of the risk assessment and planning, we have applications like MindBridge. Uh, MindBridge compares financial data against 28 control points uh, to identify level of risks in these transactions. The second is the fieldwork. Now, fieldwork is actually a highly disintegrated space, you know, where we have numerous applications to address various challenges. So for analytics, we have got tools like IDEA and Galvanize, earlier known as ACL. The key benefits of these applications are that it handles huge data sets, which is a current limitation in Excel. Uh, for data mining, we have got uh, tools like Selenoise, now, which actually helps extract data from uh, ERP systems like SAP. No, no, these tools actually extract data in a much quicker fashion uh, as probably what uh, uh, when you will extract data from the front end from the, from the SAP. So this, these kind of tools helps, you know, to extract data in a very quick fashion. Uh, third, for OCR, there are tools like Abby and Data Snipers, which actually help extract structured data from physical documents like invoice copies, purchase orders, and uh, some, some documents like that. Uh, and lastly, we have got uh, RPA tools, you know, which is basically helps to automate certain uh, functions uh, within, within the certain processes, you know, like uh, 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 audit processing or whatever that we have in, in our data extraction in, in, in our auditing processes. And finally, in documentation reporting, we have got ma audit management or I would say audit workflow tools like audit board, SAP's audit management tool. And for documentation and visualization perspective, we have got tools like Power BI and Tableau. Uh, just to you know, give a uh, give background about that, you know, we are not endorsing or sponsoring any of those products. It's just to give an example of you know what very set of products currently available in the market uh, across various spectrums, uh, and there are definitely much more products available than what we are trying to show over here. Now, to overcome the challenge of actually multiple and discrete applications in the field work, uh, we have developed a tool named iAudit, and it's a one-stop solution. Now, I actually iAudit seamlessly combines four processes. Uh, first, it automatically extracts structured data from multiple data sources like uh, SAP, Tally, etc. Second, it extracts structured data from raw images like uh, uh, bank statements, uh, tax returns, uh, invoice copies. Uh, third, it performs uh, advanced data analytics on structured data extracted. And lastly, it highlights audit issues and easy to understand dashboards and charts and graphs. Now, to summarize, our application uh, automatically audits not just system data, but also manual records and hence is a truly an end-to-end -end solution uh, helping you know, the challenge of, of the field work processes. Now, some of the benefits uh, of the tool are time savings, you know, which is uh, in the need of the R, which is, you know, our, and our tagline was the three months audit in 30 seconds. It's one of our mission statements uh, that we firmly believe in. Uh, second is that, you know, uh, again, another need of the R is 100% transactions audit in place of sample transactions. Because of technology, I know we can, and we are in a position to actually analyze all the transactions and not pinpoint it or pick up some samples. Uh, third is definitely it helps in reducing cost owing to significant time savings. Uh, uh, fourth, it's 100% automated, you know, it's at a click of a button, the users did not do anything. Uh, fifth, uh, which is a continuous auditing, and that is what probably, you know, Mr. Gokul Das Pai uh, spent some time initially on that, you know, this is something that will be the next, uh, uh, the thing of the, of, the, of the current decade, you know, where audit will no longer be a post-mortem exercise, uh, but it will be something that will be done on a continuous basis and risks uh, analysis will happen on a continuous basis. And lastly, it reduces compliance burden, you know, uh, because all the uh, non-compliances are, are actually right in front of your eyes almost on a daily basis. Uh, what we're trying to achieve, you know, is basically we're trying to actually uh, get a lot of time out from the field work of the auditors uh, or free up a lot of the time. So if you compare a pre and post uh, I audit scenario, you know, we're trying to save up to 50% of the time. Majority of time savings definitely can be realized from automating field work and streamlining risk assessment and documentation processes. Major activities of auditors, you know, right from financial statement analysis, trend analysis, audit of structured data and watching of physical documents can be automated in the, in the I audit application. Uh, so yeah, uh, thank you and over to Smith.
you know, to explain the use of uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning in audit, uh, and how some of the some of those things we have actually incorporated. So yeah, over to you, Smith. Thank you, everyone. My screen is visible, right? Uh, yes, it is. Yeah. So, uh, continuing further on Palak's brief, uh, you know, he covered a lot of automation portion. Uh, what I would like to brief here is more on how we can leverage, you know, uh, EIML. Uh, it's a hot topic, definitely, uh, in in the current times. And uh, it definitely is going to have a very lasting impact on you know auditing as a profession coming into the future. You know uh, how audit is going to happen uh, uh, continuously on the go. How data is going to get utilized uh, in much different fashion than it is right now. So let's dive a little bit more. Uh, so starting with AIML problems, uh, you know it's generally categorized into a lot of uh, uh standard category of problems you know uh, some of them are listed here and i would like to run you uh, through them uh first is clustering clustering algorithms are uh, nothing but you know they try to uh categorize data into uh, some small uh clusters so basically it's a way of grouping data points where uh into into different clusters consisting of similar data uh with inside the same cluster. So for example, if we take a very uh, small example of movie genres uh, in, in IMDB database, uh, we try to uh, segregate all the movies into a cluster, like these are romantic movies or these are action movies or some something like that. Similarly, it is used in a lot of other recommendation engines, uh, real world scenarios, you know, like YouTube, Netflix, Spotify, they use such type of algorithms. Uh, second, uh, prominent another problem type is classification algorithms. Basically, uh, this is a little different from clustering in, in the sense that in, in a clustering algorithm, uh, starting with the original data set, we don't already know what are the categories. While we are processing the ML algorithm, we get to know more and more different clusters. Whereas classification algorithms, we already have the uh, classified labels beforehand. So for example, if you want to classify images into a cat, dog, horse, bear category, uh, that is a classification algorithm. If you want to optically recognize characters in a PDF for an image, like if this is a one, two or a three, uh, these are basically classification problems uh, currently getting used in a lot of applications like Google Photos, where they automatically tag our photos like this is Smith or this is Paul, or this is Mans, etc. A uh, lot of email classification like this email is a spam or not a spam. Uh, originally, a lot of this is rule-based, but with uh, the advent of AI ML, more and more of this is getting automated into uh, self-learning uh, uh, neural network, right? Third, 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 one of the other prominent types of problems are regression algorithms, right? Regression algorithms are nothing but correlation. You know, they try to monitor uh, or correlate output value to some input uh, parameters, like say, for example, if you are doing sales forecasting or we are doing stock value predictions, uh, we try to uh, 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 correlate a, a single parameter like time or a material, etc., with uh, output value like sales or a stock price, and then try to predict. So there is two parts to here uh, to this. Like we take historical data and try to predict, or we understand historical data and try to figure out outliers. Like uh, if some, uh, as part of some audit, we are looking at a lot of sales numbers and we realize, okay, uh, at during these period of times in every year, the sales number are going up and down. So there's, there's something fishy here. So companies like MindBridge or Zoho, everyone is using these algorithms. So these are some very high level categories of problems in EIML. There are a lot of other problem groups as well. Uh, so you know, going with relevance into the auditing world, Generally, there are two types of categories that, that we look into. One is dealing with structured data, another is dealing with unstructured data. So when we refer to structured data, that is basically, you know, we have some row column strict format data, 
we have available from our ERPs or we have available from our Excel sheets or some manual data sets maintained by by a company, right? So when we when we dive into these uh, this type of analysis of structured data, we generally found, find ourselves dealing with regression related problems where uh, we are doing some kind of analysis into the financial statements, like when we see. Uh, the financial statement ledgers or different uh, debit credit entries, we realize that uh, these many frequency of transactions or uh, fictitious transactions between two parties, which is happening at fixed intervals, we, we tend to notice these kinds of pat patterns. Or for example, we uh, understand like uh, uh, when we try to predict sales numbers and we, are, we realize that uh, uh, the current values and the predicted values are very far off, so there is something wrong uh, happening in the real world. Uh, this is uh, where we do structured analysis. Similarly for unstructured data, we can do a lot of such analysis, but the major problem is uh, the regression models or uh, problems, uh, uh, the, uh, the regression machine learning models, they need numerical data. So, you know, image classification or image, they cannot recognize data from images. So the first thing that we need to do is we need to standardize this data to digitize all of this so specifically for unstructured data the problem statement in auditing is where we do we do a lot of physical vouching right uh, we go and check uh, vouchers we check contracts and uh, we take some samples out of thousands of purchase orders and then we manually check it against the system data but this problem statement can be you yeah, know what we can do is we can digitize all of these documents uh, extract structured data using OCR from all of this, and then use it, use all of this data into our regular structured data analysis. So this way we can, uh, you know, improve a lot of speed, accuracy, and the coverage of uh, uh, the data anal analysis. Uh, so specifically, you know, I audit team, uh, our team here, you know, it's been working on both of these fronts. So for structured data sets, uh, here is a you know, very, a uh, simple example of uh, where we are trying to uh, find outliers in sales numbers. So we are using a combination of prediction, predictive analytics and outlier analytics both. So in, in, in a very simple terms, uh, this graph here shows uh, original data set, which is the blue line. Uh, then we have a blue region, which is showing the threshold, threshold value. And then we have an orange line, which is the predicted value of a model. So what we're doing here is uh, we are trying to see if the original data set and the uh, how far off is the predicted numbers here. And that way we can, we'll be able to figure out if there is some fictitious activity going over here or not. And then we, def we uh, so machine learning analysis or AI analysis is mostly, uh, there's a lot of trial and error involved. So what we do is, uh, you know, we first figure out our problem statement, what we want to achieve, and then we try different models. So here, we see the results of one of the model, uh, model one. Then when we move on to the next slide, we see our similar analysis by an another model. So when we uh, here, we are, what, what we are doing is we are basically using historical sales number like last seven day moving average or last one month moving average and then trying to predict what would be the number uh, today or probably tomorrow. And then comparing that number with the actual uh, number which was posted in sales. So here, if we see, there are very two spikes at the bottom, at the start of the graph and at the end of the graph, which tell us that something fishy is going on here. So similarly, we have one more other model uh, for the same problem statement, uh, which analyzes on daily daily basis. So here we are able to see that on 20th June there is a dip, and on 29th June there is again a dip. So if that orange line is going outside the blue area. That means that uh, something is wrong because it has crossed the expected threshold. So this is uh, how we can deal with structured data. Uh, for OCR, what we are doing is, uh, as I explained, right? What we can do is here we are seeing an example invoice, invoice document, which cannot be directly analyzed or uh, be part of our analysis. But uh, what we can do is we can convert, as in get the uh, data out of this invoice, like uh, you know invoice name. Uh, like uh, the company name, the invoice number, amounts, tax amounts, address, pin codes, etc. Once we have all of the structured data, we can directly use this to uh, match to our system data. You know, as uh, as the example suggests here, 
the invoice amounts are not matching so then we know that something might be wrong here and where the real advantage of this is basically uh, right now physical vouching or document analysis is happening on a very very limited sample basis so there could be thousands and lakhs of documents flowing out but audit teams generally pick some few uh, 10 20 100 samples out of it based on the team size and time uh, available but through this now what we can do is you know all thousand or 10000 or lakhs of documents can be continuously evaluated and only the ones where there are some problems could be directly you know used by the auditor to you know provide his professional skepticism right so uh, that way i think these two areas uh, we are we are trying uh, to revol revolutionize and there are a lot of other methods also out there in the industry you know a lot of standard algorithms like abi vision google vision api uh, tesseract api is where they basically uh, allow to you know conduct ocr uh, but what we are trying to uh, uh, solve here is basically we want to improve this efficiency so the real game in ocr is uh, you know increasing the efficiency of correct detection right now probably in this example if uh, if we are able to zoom in a bit uh, we would see that the amounts might actually be missing but uh, due to some resolution or focus error the ocr was not able to detect properly so such kind of error rates if we are able to reduce we'll get much 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 better results right so these are some examples that how we are employing ml but if uh, we want to start uh, you know if someone wants to start so uh, like from zero right uh, how do we how do we employ machine learning where do we start from so so there are these are the seven basic steps that like very high level steps i i wouldn't say this is the definition but uh, this give us a brief idea as in how do we you know start from where do we start from and where do we finally end up uh, with a machine learning model deployed in our tool so first step you know we basically definitely uh, now a step before this zero step is basically what is the problem statement according to that problem statement we try to gather the relevant data so for example for time series sales prediction what we do is we get uh, sales numbers against time or for some other uh, parameters like against a particular material number material wise sales or pin code wise sales or country wise sales etc right we gather the relevant data second uh, we try to prepare this data so as part of preparing the data what we need to mostly do is uh, first try to understand like what is the patterns inherent patterns in the data we probably use some tensor flow like libraries or uh, we do uh, some kind of coding in python or we use some ready made visual algorithms where we see patterns in data like there is a, a, a constant increase in data a decrease there are some clusters forming in data there is some seasonal patterns so analyzing this data how it helps is it basically allows us to employ or you know a choose a model that fits uh, this data set uh, particularly so for example if if there is a linear uh, gradient in a data uh, a linear regression model would work very well but if uh, there is a seasonal data set a lasso model or a logistic regression model would work well so preparing the data set is uh, allows us to choose a effective model post that third stage we actually you know see the model and choose a, a particular uh, suggested model then we basically train the model on the data set we split the data into training and test sets and train the model and then we evaluate the results you know which model is working or giving us the different results like so in the previous slides we saw model 1 2 3 post this there are some advanced steps you know we can tune the model based on time based on material code based on country code these are some advanced tuning parameters and finally the predictions and the deployment of the model can happen right so this is a very basic overview of where we can start and uh, yeah i think going over to mansi for the actual demo of the tool uh, thank you so much sir i just present my screen um if somebody could confirm that if they are to see screen. yeah mansi visible uh, thank you um so uh, this is uh, the first dashboard that the user will be able to see once they log into the application 
uh, it's a web based application which can be open in google chrome or internet explorer or mozilla firefox uh, now uh, when before the user logs in what has already happened is that the application has already extracted data from underlying erps like sap microsoft navision or dynamics tally etc um from standalone systems that the organizations might have like hrms success factors salesforce uh and even from the excel files some data points if they're stored in excel like the budget numbers etc then they can be pulled from there and analyzed uh so when a user will log in he'll be able to see this window which is a compliance dashboard of the organization uh so the first table basically what it shows is a uh, module by module what has been the issue count noted divided into high medium and low uh and below table basically shows a summary by auditors like uh, what auditors did what how many checks are pending completed so uh, sort of a issue tracking and the right quadrant basically uh it shows that out of how many number of control points that are configured in the application what is the status of those as on date so how many were with issues and how many there were no issues noted how many checks failed due to some technical reasons like power failure or server crashes and last one is missing so if there were some data points that were required for running the check and they were not found then um, that would appear over here in the missing count now this application runs almost on a daily basis so if you want to go to a previous period and compare the results you can simply select the previous period and see the refreshed results second filter that we have is a branch filter so if somebody at the corporate level wants to see the status then they can select all branches if they want to see it for a particular branch they can select that particular branch and again the entire dashboards report and everything will be refreshed so this was the first dashboard page next is the audit module page Now, in audit module page, what we have done is we have divided the entire audits into these sub modules, which is fixed assets, audit to cash, production, inventory, finance, procure to pay, etc. If we were to go into one of these modules, let's say procure to pay, what uh, here we'll be able to see that the entire procure to pro pay process, as we understand, is broadly divided into purchase requisition, then purchase order, goods received, invoice received, and finally payments. So what we have done is we have divided the checks into this sub process so that it's easier to understand and it's easier to set accountability. Um, let me take you through one of these checks. So how we have done it is we have listed all the check names, the risk categorization of that particular check, uh, the issue count noted, a status column which basically shows a tick and a cross. Uh, a tick means that the control point basically passed and there were no issues noted, and a cross means that it failed and there were some or the other issues. and last refresh time basically shows that when was this check last uh, refresh so you can run different checks at different frequencies so from this the user can easily identify when was this check last run now if we were to see the details of this 4571 issues that were noted in procurement rate variation all we have to do is click on this issue and a detailed uh, summary would open up now let me select a different period uh so procurement rate variation what this check highlights is that or a particular material if the rate variation was more than the average rate then uh, those cases would appear over here so let's say if the same material was procured from the same vendor same business area in the same month and the rate variation was more than um, say 5% above its average price then those cases would appear over here Similarly, second quadrant shows same vendor across business area, across vendor same business area, and across vendor across business area. And on the right is basically a graphical presentation, a graphic of various price points at which a particular material, say edible oil, was procured in a particular month. So you can select different material and see that what was the status of those at different period and analyze it. uh we can uh, actually see the outliers from here if from particular vendor we have procured at too low a rate or too high a rate then we can further deep dive and root cause it now let me take you to one other check uh, which is duplicate vendor invoices now in duplicate vendor invoices what we do is that if uh, for a particular material the invoice was punched in twice then those cases would appear over here uh we check each and every invoice basis six parameters which is po number the item 
uh, invoice date, invoice number, vendor code, and amount. If all six of them match, then we say that it's a very high probability it's a duplicate invoice. If five of them match, then high, four, medium, and three, low. Now, as an auditor, we always want to see that what are these exact six invoices. So what we can do is we can simply click on this download button and a detailed Excel report would download. It will just take a moment to open. Yeah. So in this, we can see, uh, if we see the first two lines, then the uh, PO number, item, date, the same, uh, we can also see who was the user who punched in the invoice, the invoice number, vendor code, and the amount. So each and every check would have its own detailed Excel report and the summary for your user to analyze it further. Now, there's also an in-mail feature. If you want to share these issues with the process owners or auditees, we can simply type, a text, uh, type our text over here. Uh, we can attach the summary table and we can attach the detailed out uh, output report and send it from here. Um, so this was data extraction and uh, uh, analytics of the data. Now we also say that we are doing issue tracking and reporting. How that is done basically is uh, we go to action module and there if you go to a this non-purchase order based invoice, uh, the tracking table would open up. And there the user can mention that whether it is compliant or not. So let's say there were these three issues in BA03, but uh, um, on further deep diving, we saw that there were approvals present. So we can click on this compliance status. Um, then we can also mention a due date of fixing the issue. Uh, we can attach comments like let's say there were approvals present and we can even attach those approvals over here. And we can assign a point of contact who's supposed to track it or uh, you know, provide these answers and click on the summit. So then there will be notifications and then there is an approval mechanism to it uh, who can then further track it to closure. Now, next module is user records module. The user records module is basically this entire application is access driven. So if you want somebody to have access only for a particular branch or a business area, you can assign accesses accordingly. Or uh, let's say if you want to assign accesses according to the processes, that is put out to pay or order to cash, then you can assign accordingly. Or even at a check level, if, let's say you want somebody to see only two checks, so you can assign access at that level itself. Now next module is data ingestion module. As I said that uh, we analyze data uh, coming from S uh, ERPs, from standalone systems and Excel files. So this is the placeholder where you can upload your Excel files. Uh, it could be in .txt, .tsv, .csv or .xlsx. Uh, once you upload this data and when an audit run happens, it will take the this data, SAP, uh, ERP data and standalone systems data and then perform analytics and throw uh, the anomalies. Um, policies page is just a placeholder for you to hold the policies so that it serves as a ready reference uh, to understand the SOPs and the processes there in an organization. And the last tab is a processing tab. Now what this processing tab basically does is that if let's say somebody has said that they have fixed the issues. Now if you want to see that whether those issues were fixed or not, what you can do is you can click on this quick run, select that particular check and click on start run. When you do that, the system will go and fetch data from ERPs or other systems, perform analytics and give you the updated results so that you can actually verify whether the set thing was done or not. And second option is to create a scheduler. Uh, so whenever you want to perform this check, you can simply click on a particular check or all checks and set the frequency when you want to repeat it. So let's say you want all these checks to run on a daily basis at let's say, um, 10 p.m. then you can select that time and date and then uh, every day at 10 o'clock these data points will run and you can see the results. Um, now so this is all about structured data set that I've spoken so far that with, by structure uh, what I mean is that anything that is in the form of rows and columns. Now as an auditor we also analyze unstructured data which is the pdf or invoice copies etc. So in the audit module itself, what we have is a manual check option. Um, 
if you go further right. And now here there are various uh, checkpoints listed down. So as an order, we can directly like let's say this does the company have an approved procure to pay policy. You can just mention the issue count and everything down here um, on in the uh, the low table. Or what you can do is let's say for a check like invoice verification. When you click on this particular check, what would happen is that a list of all the invoices present in the system would appear over here. And when you click on one of these invoices, whatever documents that you have scanned and uh, saved in a folder would be scanned through using OCR technologies. It will be matched with the system data and give you the results that what has matched and what does not. So out of the five parameters that, say, that the user has defined uh, for matching, uh, the four of them have matched and this one particular thing has not matched the, where the cross is coming. So you can actually uh, zoom in and see that what is the amount present here and why it has not matched and then um, ask the auditor to either fix it or provide the explanations. And stuff. So this is about the unstructured data set and uh, this brings me to the end of my demo. Uh, thank you so much. Over to you, Manoli. Thank you. Thank you so much, Palak, Mansi, and Smith. The presentation was really thorough and the kind of deep dive uh, in the audit world and your software that you guys provided was remarkable. Um, with the structured data, I could really get the three risk models that you guys covered, um, as well as the seven steps of ML that you provided will be really helpful to the people, I think, who are just starting out with their uh, machine learning journey. So thank you so much for that. Um, yeah, the I audit software also seemed like really user friendly and efficient. Uh, but I want to uh, now move on to the Q and A part. So, if there are any questions, let me just check the chat box and come to that. Um, yeah, I see one question. So it's from Anup. It's regarding OCR. Invoice formats for each and every vendor is different. Um, do one need to design rules for each of them or is it being handled by I audit? So I think Palak, yeah, you are, I'll, okay. Yeah, I'll probably I'll just uh, answer it for the benefit of the audience. Yeah. Uh, basically that bit, you know, we have handled in the application. So what we have done is that key the I audit tool, the way we have designed is it matches the system data with the physical record. You know, rather than extracting all the data points from the physical document, what the way you have designed is that we are just simply matching the records that is available in the system with the physical records. So, and wherever the system is not able to match that specific point, it will highlight in red is what probably Manchi showed in that uh, particular slide. So that's why, you know, that we are edit, uh, through this method, we are eliminating uh, the, you know, the challenge of actually streamlining the tool for each and every different, different invoice types and invoice formats. Got it. Thank you. Um, there's also one more question. So as a newly qualified CA with a small firm exposure, how do you enter into analytics? So does anyone want to take this? Yeah, uh, so I think uh, the best way uh, to enter analytics is what probably Mr. Parakir also mentioned is use of Excel, you know, the age old Excel. Uh, that and uh, uh, try to, you know, understand. See, Excel probably, when we understand Excel, you know, we just we feel like yeah, once Excel is involved about macros, we need to learn those, those things, you know, only then we know Excel or don't, only then we know advanced Excel, but it actually is not true. Uh, even though if you will not believe and know we rely on certain 10, 15 functions in Excel, like sum ifs, count ifs, uh, nested ifs, you know, basically ifs within ifs and within ifs. So those types of functions we are using day in and day out, you know, even within our organization currently in our startup, you know, to probably build rules uh, for a lot of, lot of the checks that we have developed. So if, if you know, and if you learn these certain uh, functions and apply in the data sets that you are know, that you get probably that will be through Tally or you know, SAP or whatever your system that you have, I think you or your foundation of analytics will be very strong. So that's that's the place I would recommend to start from. Yeah, and just with Alex's answer, I think uh, there are so many like uh, courses available online. Maybe you could just start off by gaining some skills online on YouTube or Coursera. Um, there's tons of resources now available. Okay, let's see if there are more questions. Um, I think, Parikshit, we have one for you. Um, 
did you find writing code internally better than procuring out of shelf products from Melroy? Uh, yeah, it's not so much a question of better or worse. I think what we found is we had the talent within. We had the talent within our teams. We and it was a conscious decision. We built a team which could, uh, you know, write code and develop these programs on our own. Um, you know, obviously, as the other speakers mentioned, there are some really good tools out there. But but always, uh, you know, and particularly in a corporate, it's always a trade off between uh, the budget you have. And, you know, the, uh, the ROI that you can show the management. And that's why, if you remember, one of the things Tomash also mentioned earlier was, you know, start small, go for the low-hanging fruits and build that executive sponsorship. So, so we took, uh, and, you know, whatever we spoke about was not something done overnight. It's taken as it's been a journey. That's why I use the word journey. It's been a journey of a few years to get acceptability, first of all, within the wider audit team itself to have a data-driven analytics-based approach and also to get buy-in from our management. And through that journey, we have specifically invested in people who can, you know, do it internally for us. But that does not mean we have precluded, um, you know, off-the-shelf software. Uh, the only challenge with off-the-shelf sometimes is, uh, you know, again, for sometimes for companies like ours, which are just too large sometimes for their own good, things are so complex, so complicated, uh, you know, it becomes very difficult. It's an ever-evolving environment, the system environment, the data environment, the process environment. So it just helps to have somebody internally who also understands the business and can quickly react. And that's why I said we have a mix of finance folks and technical folks as well. So that's how our journey has been. But, uh, you know, obviously we do keep an eye out for other products as well. Yeah, that's great. And if I can just add to what Pari has just said, uh, we actually started uh, with like a team of six, seven Pari, correct me if I'm wrong. And with uh, kind of like showing the skills and the uh, ROE to our senior leadership, we expanded the team to 14 people strong uh, currently. So it was kind of like a journey where we started small, we aimed for like low hanging fruits. We showed like the uh, deliverables and benefits coming out of that. And based on that, we actually uh, hired new team members who have like certain skill sets that help us continue to grow uh, uh, during this journey. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Um, the next one is for the iAudit team. Uh, so Rahul is asking if the iAudit application is for auditors in practice to use for any industry or is it customization by company as application to start an internal audit function? Uh, so uh, the way we started was, you know, was for the companies to use it internally. Uh, because, you know, this is one of the tools that can be used as a continuous control monitoring tool. Uh, and uh, now that, you know, actually we got a lot of requests from the auditing firms, uh, especially the practicing firms. So we get you know, slowly actually moving and pivoting to, you know, also help the auditing firms. So to answer that question, basically the first thing is we have built it for the companies and where they can do some customizations, they can add some certain audit checks in the platform. Okay. Um, there's one more for you guys. Um, suppose a company has recently signed a contract which is non-compliant with certain policy of the company, uh, say the credit period. Will unstructured analysis and I audit identify such non-compliance? And this is from Arsalan. Um, yes. So uh, although we have not built this particular uh, checkpoint uh, currently in the application, uh, but such type of, you know, points can easily be in tracked uh, in the application. So it's possible. Okay. Um, the next one is from our member, Shrinivas. Um, he's saying great presentation, very interesting. And he has just one general question to any one of you. Any advice on how the business case proposals to invest significantly on IT systems for internal audit are being presented to board or senior leadership? I can attempt to answer that. Uh, again, I think it, it all depends on uh, the tone at the top and the general culture of the, of the company, right? If there is wider support and not just for internal audit, if there's widespread support within the company to support more data-driven initiatives, embrace automation and all that, it's, it just makes life easier. And I think as, as far as internal audit is concerned, um, 
usually it helps to sit on a wave that is rising right like i said if maybe maybe if the internal audit is part of the overall finance organization if the cfo is actually pushing for automation and there's funding coming for that it helps to latch on to that initiative and make use of it um, and where that doesn't happen of course i go back to what we earlier said you know you need to do some some use case and show some benefits out of it start small and go back and demonstrate that to the to the board and the leadership that this is really making sense right and and also just one example in our case also was you know with the whole pandemic situation last year where everybody was forced to work virtually and physical face to face audits completely have come to a standstill i think management i mean the board the senior leadership has also realized that you know analytics and automation is the only way to go right now we are all going to be in a remote working environment for the foreseeable future and maybe permanently so it's very important that you know you do more with less sitting remotely from wherever you are so i think that natural acceptance is also coming about more and more great thank you so we have one more from anup he's saying regarding bank statements do system readable formats like mt940/ mt942/ bai2 are being consumed by i audit for gathering structured information Yes. So uh, basically, you know, that is one of our core activities is that we keep integrating our application with more and more uh, uh, structured formats, integrating with ERP systems, uh, standalone systems. That is something that is an ongoing activity within within our our, our company, and definitely a sense that we are doing it presently. Okay. Great. So one last question. I know it's late in India. Um, is your software being used by any companies or only with your clients? And are you creating jobs for those interested in IT or auditing? Um, so we already have a product that is being used by companies over here in India. Um, companies like uh, India Bills Housing Finance, Balaji Vipas Private Limited, which is like a household name here back in India. Uh, are using it, and then we are prominently there in the BFSS segment. Uh, so a lot of cooperative banks are using it, and we are doing uh, a couple of projects with some of the biggest brands like TV, uh, TVS, IGC, IDBI, Tas Pharma, etc. Uh, coming to the second question, that are we creating jobs for IT and auditing? Yes, uh, we are. So uh, we are actually uh, always on the lookout of new talents for data analytics or chartered accountants who have a good hold on Excel. uh in the tech team also we always looking for software developers both front end and back end so yes okay great thank you so much guys i'm going to hand it over to my colleague uh, ca pravin jain ji now you are on mute pravin ji yeah yeah sorry uh, meloni thank you meloni and i would like to express our sincere thank to palak mansi and parikshit and toms the uh, the excellent topic uh, the which is the need of the hour uh, on the topic uh, automation and use of ai ml top ml and for giving a wonderful coverage and uh, the speech so and we also very thankful and gratitude to the participant and very nice uh, time in the weekend and uh, it's very late to india so we we will see you next time again and we uh, uh, like request uh, to the speakers to uh, we can go in that in depth of these topics uh, can cover in the next time so i'll appreciate and we have a very good evening and good night to india and good afternoon in dc metro area and <laughs> good morning rest of the america thank you have a nice day bye yeah miloni can you okay. yeah yeah thank you everyone and with this i am concluding our session for the day thank you 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 so much